at least in the media perception, you know, kind of the leader of the hippies. Anything that had a left-wing cultural content to it in the city of Detroit during this period, I was involved in. I was huge, and I was the hugest uh, bet noir imaginable. And every terrible thing, I was all that rolled into one in Detroit. I was blasted. We. He was an artist and he was a poet. Taking LSD regularly. Kind of a guiding light. I had no fear. And John Sinclair was kind of one of us. I was very much committed to doing something in Detroit to make a change, to make it be different. Culminating with my association with the MC5. We really were hoodlums from downriver and we didn't do so good in business, you know? <laughs> and, and John could at least walk amongst them without being one of them. You know, let's get this beatnik poet fucker, you know? We get him, we get Wayne State, we get Wayne State. Okay, we're making some progress. <laughs> John Sinclair and the Trans Love Energies lived here, but they also had another building down the block. They put up a sign outside that said, burn, baby, burn. And that was the red flag in the face of the bull. And then you hear this noise of people clumping up the stairs to the second floor where we were, and a pounding on the door, and we went up there, and there's like seven uh, police officers, army troops, National Guard, the sordid pigs, as we called them that. There was a report of sniper fire from our rooftop. We said, bullshit. There's no sniper fire from up here. And then they called me by name and struck terror into my heart. And then it was clear that they were just there to harass us, that they really had no pretense. So I summoned up all of my courage and told them to get the fuck out of our house. hundreds and then thousands of people would come to every gig that we played in the Detroit area and in Michigan. This was something that was a very palpable threat to their way of life. We wanted their daughters to take their clothes off and fuck us, you know? I mean, let's put it in so many words, you know? We wanted to get high with their sons behind the fucking gymnasium, smoke joints, you know? Give them some acid see what happened. Uh, John and I were walking across the diag, you know, and I said, you know, these Black Panther guys are really kicking some ass, you know, they got these long black leather coats, this is kind of a cool image, you know. I said, I mean, you know, it's too bad that white people ain't cool like that. And John goes, oh, white Panthers. They didn't like us much in the beginning. They, they wrote about us in uh, the, the Black Panther newspaper. They called us psychedelic clowns. <laughs> we were gone. There's no sense, no rhyme, no reason to it. We were out of our minds, and we had no fear. 
We were righteous. We were plugged into the universe. We were doing what the universe told us to do. White Panther program is cultural revolution by any means necessary. Uh, we've drawn up a 10 point program. First point is uh, full endorsement and support for the Black Panther Party's 10 point program. Uh, point two is uh, total assault on the culture by any means necessary, including rock and roll dope and fucking in the streets. It was the farthest thing from a political organization that you could possibly imagine. You know, the truth be told. It was a bunch of guys on marijuana and acid and beer sitting around a big table laughing their asses off. And so he called the famous phone call. He called Jack Holzman and said, I've got you two great bands. I've just seen two great bands. And he said, offer the big band 20 and a little band 5. It's a signing bonus and see if we can get them both. So I put my hand over the thing and he said, 20 for you. And I said, yeah, fuck yes. And he turns to Jimmy Silver, who's sitting there with me. Five for you, will you take it? 5,000 for the studio, yes. <laughs> and man, we were signed right then, you know. It was, it was done, boom. By Monday morning at 10 o'clock, it was done. Here I got two of the greatest bands in the history of the world with a phone call. This is probably the highest moment of our mutual existence. We signed a major label record contract and our career was going to unfold following this night. You know, we were going to record an album. So we would be in the sweepstakes. In Boston, when the band was playing at the, the Boston Tea Party, probably November or December. Friday, December 13th, 1968, in the first year of Zentai. John wrote the liner notes for the album. MC5 is a whole thing. There is no way to get at the music without taking in the whole context of the music, too. There is no separation. And let me kick out the chain. are a lonely, desperate people pulled apart by the killer forces of capitalism and competition, and we need the music to hold us together. Go wild. The world is yours. Take it now and be one with it. Kick out the jams, motherfucker, and stay alive with the MC5. <laughs> Electra was probably the most left-leaning company of all. But we were no left liberals, you know. We were fucking LSD-driven total maniacs in the universe. <laughs> Not only were we really aggressive and really nuts, we were also involved in this totally insane political thing which scared the living hell out of everybody. We fancied ourselves revolutionaries. We wanted to tear all the shit down. They didn't ever, there was never a confrontation in our household where they said, man, you guys are on the wrong track, you can't go around doing horseshit. Damn. We were being the people that we were when they signed us. We were not the people they thought we were, some rock and roll band with a hype, a revolutionary hype. Of course, what Electra did then was produce the album without the written uh, liner notes by John Sinclair. So it was just a picture. You opened it up and you got a picture of the band. We trusted these motherfuckers, these slick New York record people, to do the things that they said they were going to do because we were going to do what we were going to do. Uh, and this led to the, the MC5 being dropped by Elektra. It's just like any time you try to do anything there. On the one hand, <laughs> they say it's an act. On the other hand, they put you in jail. You know, I mean, they, they whipsaw you between all the various responses of hatred, you know. But basically, they don't want you to proceed. First annual Detroit Rock and Roll Revival at the Michigan State Fairground. The headliners were Chuck Berry, MC5, Sun Ra. The past, the present, the future, you know. <laughs> well, I thought there was a direct line. I remember that now. Fred Smith had a space suit on. 
up in a fucking silver spaceman outfit with a top. I was kind of disgusted with him because I didn't understand it really. It was just kind of a menacing thing, you know. I just thought that they had gotten outside of the format. Michael Davis falling backwards off the stage and Wayne Kramer swinging like a monkey on the bars <laughs> and Fred Smith in a spaceman outfit. I thought they'd lost their fucking minds. <laughs> and I thought it was inauthentic. To get back to the point of these remarks, I just thought they were going in another direction that wasn't going to bode well for them or for me, <laughs> for that matter. Why for you? Well, I was their manager. Things of the, I developed their stage presentation with them, and I didn't get it. But I knew that it didn't mean well for me because I wasn't part of it. And I didn't approve of it. And contradictions were beginning to develop. The twist which ended in them dumping me like two weeks later or something. Whatever the time, when, when, when did I get fired? Two weeks later? About two weeks later. John's commitment to the band had really deteriorated as well because of his own legal problems and his own um, self-importance and his role in the revolution. You know, he was being looked to as this guru and, and ca started calling John the pharaoh. And, yeah. and you say he that in humor, but he took on pharaoh-like qualities. You know, he, he became very dogmatic and very controlling. The center never holds. And that moment where everything was totally together is only for a moment. It's only for an instant. It's only for a day. And the one thing you can count on is everything is going to change. All of a sudden, we're in a moment where John Sinclair has gone to prison for nine and a half to 10 years for possession of two marijuana cigarettes. Thank you.